I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. Uh, Tis the season, as they say. It's Christmas time, which is always a favorite. Uh, I do love giving people ideas about things they can get. Uh, and you, if you go to philmerch.com, use the promo code Phil20. Got a lot of unashamed gear uh, that's there. Make great gifts. There's some uncanceled stuff there. Love always protects. It's a great t shirt. So if you're looking for a Christmas idea, check out philmerch.com. Use the promo code Phil20 uh, to save you some money and get a great gift. So, Jace, you're, you're uh, making big plans for Christmas season. I mean, what, what, what are you doing? Well, what are you I had doing? a uh, huge argument with my wife yesterday because. Shocker. Uh, well, yeah, it was done in love. We spoke the truth in love because she said, what do you want for Christmas? And without hesitation, I said, I'd like for you to get me a leaf blower. A leaf she, blower. Yeah, because the one I got literally fell apart. And you know, hey, this Dad, time of you, year. Dad, have you ever had a leaf blower? Uh, you can make an argument. Everyone needs one, but I never got around to getting one. <laughs> <laughs> I always said when they said when are you going to mow your grass I always said frost to get it Just be patient well I go. bought a house look let me give you the back story I bought a house that is down a hill which was which was I, I considered it you know Willie's like hey why don't you y'all move in we'll, we'll all live on the same road but there wasn't one house left but it was at the bottom of the hill. You know, Willie's up there at the top. And so what happens in Louisiana, because you don't, you don't wonder if it's going to rain. You wonder when it's going to stop raining. And so I got some drainage issues. So about once a week, I got to go out there and get the leaves out of every possible drain area. Because if it don't, uh, my house will flood, which has happened a couple times. So it's not like I'm, you know, I'm obsessed with blowing leaves but i i need that but miss is like i'm not getting you that for christmas so why she's like that's just because i don't want to say what'd you get jay's for christmas a leaf blower she said that makes me look like a terrible wife i was like but that's what i want <laughs> you're telling me the it, it, it didn't end well she was like no i'm not getting you that so i'll probably have to go buy my own christmas present once again you're facing the intriguing elements that faces individuals who must live in subdivisions. Yeah, it's a subdivision <laughs> problem. It's a tough place to live. So, but I love this time of season, despite the arguments, because you know we've had a big run-in battle this year because you know our property down here that we all hunt and enjoy has mainly been a duck hunting property. I mean, you started off buying this property, then. Yep. I, I think I guess when you ran out of money, you got me and Willie to get some of the property. I actually moved on it just prior to running out. Yeah, I said I need <laughs> these boys. Everybody's going hunting down there, but nobody's paying for the diesel and all the well, equipment. Yeah. So and, we've bought a bunch of land, and we all own it. Phil, Willie, and me. Well, Willie, up until about a year ago, it has not spent a whole lot of time here. But and correct. he's a deer hunter, and we're duck hunters. But what happened is, you know how Willie is. Willie took one of the employees at Duck Commander, which is was my right hand man at Duck Commander, Jay Stone, your son in law, Al, and he hired him to be a deer manager on the property. So I thought that sounded like a great idea. Terrible idea. Because <laughs> look, now he sent me it, just an example. So, and, and this this story has a happy ending, but for me, but here's some of the things that happen. And, and look, a lot of times you have the uh, opportunity to live Christ in the ordinary details of life. And because look, I've been put to the test on this. My patience, my uh, temper, which I don't really have a temper. But when I get a text that says, don't drive by this certain hole because I'm deer hunting, well, you're putting my faith to the test right there. That's why I reminded Stone, I said, just remember, my friend, there's a great difference between manager and owner. Well, I've had, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's that's biblical. <laughs> so, so then the next next phase of this ongoing battle, I mean, this, you could you want a TV show 
just the conflict that's happened with the deer side and the duck. Phil, would you say has been, I'd say it's been a 10 out of 10 during, during this season. Cause we all gather up during the holidays. I got my sons here, but you know, Jay said, well, you didn't, you, it, his argument was you didn't tell me you were bringing your sons. And I'm thinking, where, where in this relationship do I have to be telling you who I'm bringing, especially my own flesh and you blood? Have to be, Jace, you have to be careful because you possibly, with your temperament, you could be kind of like prone to uh, being anti-managed. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm an anti- <laughs> <laughs> That woman here has been trying to manage you for about 30 years. Yeah. Okay? So look, so, so, you know, so, you know how that's true, Deb, because his last name is Robertson. I, I kind of affected so look, all that. So is. I just sort of grin and lean back, you know, and I said, boy, but, but it is a really a great place to bring your family members and your children. Well, that's a good and reminder. We've got 10 year old girls making shots at 350 yards. You're like with a high fired rifle. I mean, they're 10 years old. So let me finish this story. So we come down to go duck on. Now we have seven hunters. Well, I look when I walked in the bay door, Jay Stone, the deer manager is not here, but he told my son, because he found out he was duck hunting with us. Don't take the six seater four wheeler or six wheeler, whatever it is, because I have a bunch of deer stuff I have to do and I'll be later. So we have seven people. Well, there's two, two seaters left. So I'm looking, there's seven people, but we have two wheelers that only hold four people. And so they're taking all the gear, the duck hunting gear out of this six seater. And so I said, what are you doing? And my son Reed said, well, Jay, I said, the deer manager. He said, yeah told us not to take this vehicle. I said, but we have seven people. He said, well, that's just what he said. I said, we'll call him up. (laughs) And so he calls him up and puts him on speaker. And I said, we have seven men. We're going to take a six seater and a two seater, which will leave room for an extra person. If we so desire to pick somebody up on the way. So after I said that, he started talking and I said, Reed, I said, no, that conversation is over now. You can hang up. And he did. (laughs) So I could have been a little, (laughs) but it was just, I was so like appalled that a guy that's not here, who's managing deer is saying, y'all cram in four (laughs) seats to go duck hunting and you're actually doing this. So I said all that to set this up to say this. So a a couple days later, we're duck hunting, and Willie and Corey are deer hunting. They have all their camera people, you know, they're doing, and Jay is like the assistant to the, he's the deer man. He set the stage for, we're going to shoot a deer. Corey's never killed a deer, so we're trying this. And, and, and Jay's already told us, stay away from this corner of the property. There's a major production going on, which I'm just rolling my eyes. I'm like, well, we're just going to duck hunt. Y'all leave us alone. Willie's wife has be- become a deer hunter. Yeah. So we, we're duck hunting, and we're shooting ducks. Everybody's happy. And, and I hear a compressed sound, because I think they're shooting you know, the rifles which is nice with a compressed rifle, but I hear it go off. And I said, well, that, I think Corey shot a deer. And sure enough, we get a text, shot a big buck, but we're having trouble finding him. Ooh, we're going to get the dogs and we're going the to deer get the wing scouts. has called the duck wing. Yeah. And they're saying, you duck hunters, we have a deer, Mm-hmm. But we can't find the, the deer. We the think deer. the deer is dead, but we can't find the yeah. deer. So they're talking about all the things they're going to do. So if y'all hear a bunch of vehicles and people hollering, it's all we're we looking for the deer. Dog, track dogs, you know, to find the so deer. We roll our eyes. We get back to duck hunting. The duck hunt, that was at like 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So we're leaving at about 1030. We have a cameraman with us sent to film the duck hunt. And he's a man of few words. And so we're riding out on the main little road there. I, a, I didn't actually get his name. I actually don't know his name. 
I, I don't either. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I met That's him. But the cameraman is riding with us. <laughs> yeah, the cameraman was with, with us, and so we're riding down the road. We're talking about the duck hunt. Everybody, I'm, I'm driving. I'm focused on the road. All we had and, was the report. Corey got a deer it, somewhere. Exactly. Out there. We don't forgot about all that. So we, I hear a voice from the back seat, and it's the cameraman who said, "Do y'all want that that big dead deer laying in the road?" And everybody kind of stopped and looked, and I think Phil said, "Do what?" He said there was a there was a deer back there in the road, and I said, "Was Not he beside the road?" Yeah, he he said beside the road, but and Phil said, "Was it standing?" And he said, "No, it looked dead to me." So I stopped and backed up, and as I'm backing up, it was literally ten feet off the road. There's a huge deer. And I thought to myself where Corey was hunting, which was not very far. And I thought, well, here's the deer just laying here right beside the road. So I call Willie. No answer. I call Corey. No answer. Because they're driving back and in between our, our hunting place and town is a dead zone, which they were in. I didn't realize that. So I called Jay. But I, I uh, what do you call it where you're seeing each other? Uh, yeah, I FaceTimed him. And so he's like, yeah. That was his response. Because he's angry because they can't find this deer. And so I turned it around and I said, you're a terrible tracker. <laughs> he said, and his eyes got real big. And he's like, w where are y'all? I said, we almost ran over it. <laughs> we found your deer. Mr. Big Deer Hunter, I said, I said, it's 30 yards from where Corey shot it. He's like, well, that, that, that can't be right. I turned it back around. I said, well, what is this? And he said, well, are y'all going to, y'all going to load it up? I said, no. <laughs> I, <laughs> tell your people to come get your deer. <laughs> it's in the road. He's like, well, where are you? I said, get on the main road. You can't miss it. <laughs> I said, you drove right by it. And so then I told him the cameraman spotted it. He said, well, y'all didn't see it either. I said, because I don't have a duck down in this area. If I did, I would have been looking. But if I would have shot a deer and I was leaving, I would have been looking around. At least on the side of the road. I mean, come on. Well, so what was funny is we had our cameraman film because Phil, he said, here's what they do, you know, these big deer hunters. So Phil got him in Burley you behind know, We're holding it. up the deer's oh, head. Oh, they were taking pictures and, you know, hold the deer Ugh. out front. We got him. We got him. And so, They had searched uh, the woods for about two hours. It came up empty-handed. We drove by out there and we said, the cameraman says, what about this one, the dead one back there? And I said, a deer? He said, yeah. We so, back up, there's the deer. I've was never the, seen people get so happy. Corey, uh, Willie. Oh, they all drove Stone. back. They had the cameraman everywhere. They're like, what do, you, what do you think? And I said, I think these deer scouts are terrible. These so-called deer hunters, they're shooting a deer and they can't even find him. He's laying in the middle of the road. I threw him under the bus as hard. And look, Al, it was the greatest thing that ever happened because they were so embarrassed now. They basically <laughs> concluded that they want to just leave me alone. They want to work with us. <laughs> they want to work with us now. The so, not so, so, so what are the odds so, of that happening? I mean, like so, one in a million. So for our audience, just I, I'm sure you've read the underlying situation. There's a bit of a um, friendly rivalry between the duck camp and the deer camp. And so I think you're seeing part of that as it plays out. But they're sure not going to mess with Jay's anymore, that's for sure. But all this was on film, right? They filmed Everybody it filmed all, all this coming to a place... Near you. I think it'll be great All footage right. when they finally get get it on there. The well, duck hunters found on, the deer. You know, I highly. It, it, if they run my take on it, they're gonna have to get really thick skin because <laughs> I ran over them and backed it up. <laughs> All in good fun. It's probably gonna be on <clears throat> duckcommander.com, dot com, but I will be interested to hear the rebuttal on our brother podcast uh, in the, the duck call room. So we'll see about that. Yeah. All right, we, we're about to take a break. On the other side, our old friend Larry Bowles is still in town, so he's going to join us for uh, the rest of the podcast. So we'll see you after the break. 
So I always love surprises, uh, you know, and I guess that's why I love the Christmas season. You know, you get you got that box and you're not sure what's in it. You think, you hope, maybe, possibly, uh, but you have to open it up to find out. And uh, one of our sponsors is a group called Bespoke Post, and they have what they call a box of awesome collection. And it's really that spark of the unexpected. And that's what I really love about it. Every month I get a box. It shows up at my house. I see that uh, BP on there, that bespoke post, and I know there's going to be some awesome things in there. So what I did was I, I went onto their website. I took a little quiz at boxofawesome.com. And in that, I told them what I like, the kind of things I like. And so now they send me these little surprise gifts uh, for the things that I like to do. So it's really a lot of pocket knives and stuff for outdoors. Cooking things is what I like to do. So here's what you do. If you want to check them out, go to boxofawesome.com. You take that quiz. Uh, you're going to get a new box every month across a ton of categories. The boxes are valued at about 70 bucks, but you only pay a fraction of that price. So you're getting a deal every time you get the box. You're also supporting a small business, which we like that because most of these are from small up and coming brands and it's free to sign up. You can skip a month. You can cancel any time. So if you want to get 20% off your first monthly box, go sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code Phil at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com. Use the code Phil, 20% off your first box. Check them out. So welcome back to Unashamed. Our old friend Larry Bowles is in the house. Good to be here, um, brother. As, yeah. It's always a pleasure. Our last discussion uh, that we had with you on the ascension uh, of Jesus was spectacular. Oh, by the way, yeah, it's I, it's a it's an overlooked uh, thing in Scripture, and I just think that really unlocks a lot of things. We didn't talk about it on the last podcast, but you started your sermon with an illustration of a Christmas party, and you had the guests come in, and each guest was a different element of the of the gospel right. symbols that right. we kind of display. And then you said, <laughs> you know, everybody's like, hey, crucifixion, hey, resurrection, good yeah. to see you guys. Uh, who's the guy over there in the corner? Yeah. Oh, that's the ascension. <laughs> the end of the couch. Nobody. And somebody's like, oh, no, you're the great commission. He's like, no, nah, not exactly. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the ascension. We're so. laughing, but that's really sad. <laughs> it really is. That's what he's doing right yeah. now. Yeah. Look, there's no holiday. There's no. Yeah, I, 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 that was my point. You can buy a card for Christmas. You can buy a card for Good Friday. You can buy a card for Easter. Well, there is the no birth. ascension card. No. You can't go to Hallmark the birth, and get that. So, uh, the yeah. birth of Christ, yeah. the death, and the resurrection is yeah. basically the... Yeah. So we talked about Jace adding a, a, a picture of the throne to, to that arrow. Yeah. Maybe we should also, 40 days, it would, it would probably hit somewhere in late May to early yeah. June. And we know it. We That's need the to thing. Have, we know exactly yeah. when it is. It's ten, yeah. yeah, it's 40 days. Yeah. Then you could have another one ten days later when the spirit was poured yeah. out. I yeah. think that was imp that was an important occurrence. Yeah, and I mean the thing of it is in in a lot of the liturgical fellowships, you know, high that's church exact, kind of that's stuff. That's that Dasher word. Now. Yeah, and use I'm it sorry. In a yeah, but <laughs> can you use that in a sentence? Yeah, I mean if you if you come out of a out of a, a Roman Catholic you know background or or something like that, you, mm -hmm. you I mean that's a a day of holy obligation for you, yeah. you know, and and so yeah, it's a. It, yeah. Well, I noticed. <clears throat> I noticed Larry also dropped eschatology in his sermon. <laughs> so is, I is, heard is that. that. Uh, I thought, hey, I know what that means. Yeah, yeah. Es eschatologically speaking, yeah, something like that. And we're talking in end times, so yeah. Well, every time somebody makes fun of my grammatical mistakes or my, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it when you talk a certain way, your accent? Yeah, whenever someone makes, I do have an accent. You though. do, but you have a yeah. phraseology. Yeah, that is unique to you. Which is a word I would never use. Right. But what I'm saying when they do that, I can then quote that verse that that's just to show that the power is from God I'm and just, not of yourself. That's I'm right. a, I'm, the my, dunamis. My yeah. jar, my clay jar, it has several <laughs> blemishes. <laughs> Cracks. I remember when he, he did uh, the sermon on the cracked pots, you know, and we're all, right, we're all a bunch pot. of cracked I mean, Mine's pots, got like so. pieces missing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Jace, you use a lot of idioms, yeah, which that. sounds he a does. lot like idiot. Yeah, so <laughs> that's true. He's yeah, and I yeah. Idioms well, look, I'll shadows. tell y'all this because y'all said we were going to talk about the resurrection. So I had a dream, and it was a it was a movie. It was like a movie, mm. and I'll tell you the dream, and because I you're you're preaching on the resurrection right now. Yeah, next Sunday. So I have an idea. Now, look, this could be totally theologically a nightmare, but I had a dream. I had a dream. <laughs> I, uh, I did that once, and I'm going out on a wire here. So, yeah, you're out there, pal. We, there so no here net. was the dream. No net. Uh, so what if society had tried to hold accountable the ones who crucified Jesus? Mm. So this is my dream, because it's like Jesus dies, and then somebody starts to say, wait a minute now, this this guy was innocent. So the, this was my dream. The people are talking, and so they're like, we got to do an investigation. And so even though we know as believers this was God's plan, you know, I'm, I'm having this, this dream. And so, and the irony of my dream was social media, I mean, they had like TV cameras, and even though it was in a time that didn't, mm. you know, when you dream, Mm -hmm. So I'm just telling you my dream. That's why I said theologically this is a nightmare, but I had the dream. So they're they're like, I mean, what this 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 was an injustice. This right. this should not have happened. <clears throat> but what happens is simultaneously in the dream, well, there's a controversy over they can't find his body. And so then instead of the investigation being there was an injustice, it then the social media gets where is the body? It, that that takes off mm -hmm. and and goes viral. So this is, and I made notes about you know how when you have a dream if you don't you write, write it, down. it down. Yeah, yeah. so I wrote I wrote some of this down because I thought it was fascinating. <clears throat> then when you said we were doing it about the resurrection, I was like, this is this is perfect. So so the case of the injustice was actually because they did have a really good case because Jesus didn't do anything wrong. Mm. But now we have no body, and you know what the saying is. Well, that saying started getting out. Well, you can't have a crime if there's no body. Right. So in the dream of the movie, it became a movie. You know how your dream can just... It became a movie about how can you prove a crime was committed if you don't have the body. And the irony is that Jesus gave his life for their crimes. Mm. And so, because it was God's plan for him to die. So that was kind of my dream in that he's, you couldn't find the body, so you couldn't prove them guilty. But he was saying, we're not going to prove them guilty because I gave my life wow. on a cross. I, I thought it was. I, I love the way your mind works. I really do. <laughs> I mean, it's just so cool because it, you open, you open doors, you know, that, that, I had that, that dream, and I thought it was... People don't think yeah. to open, and then you find truth beyond that. It's just really cool. Maybe that's what happened. Yeah. I was dreaming that, and I thought it was fascinating that he didn't want you... He didn't want them to investigate the crime because it was his love and grace given. So, yeah, I mean, I think, that, I think it would make a good movie. Oh, I do too. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you took that concept and made a movie out of it, I, where it was his plan all along, but he took away a way to prove their injustice well, with it, the resurrection. I always always say that anytime you, you see the words, so that, in Scripture, God is doing something in sovereign authority. He did this so that. Uh, for example, uh, Jesus is standing there toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Jews, and he's claiming to be God. And they're like, don't you know that God's going to judge you for that? And he's like, I don't think you you understand who you're talking to. He said, the Father judges no one, but all authority and judgment has been given to the Son so that all will honor the Son in exactly the way that they honor the Father. And that happened quickly mm -hmm. from the time they just walked out there in a few days and said, where? Where is, his, where is his body? Where is he? Right. He began these appearances 
but, but you know, you could have made it a lot easier. This is the, yeah, this is prophecy, the way prophecy works. Yeah. This takes it out of the realm of man's will and, and, you know, it's not yeah. by human will or man's human desire, but this is by God so that all will know and all will honor him. So yeah. would it be fair to say <clears throat> that most people that were there at the time didn't believe it? Yeah. Well, they didn't you know, people it. coming back from the dead, when you, when you, if somebody mentions that, I'm going to beat death. Mm. Yeah. Most people will say, yeah, I, I don't think so. But to Larry's no point. No one else has done it. To Larry's point on the last, last podcast, that Luke 24, when he said he's fulfilled the scripture, you think even Isaiah, you know, the first half or whatever is about the king, which is all great. And then all of a sudden you have this suffering servant. Mm -hmm. Well, people are like, what? Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. How is a king going to be a suffering, suffering, you know, you know that Isaiah uh, uh, 51 and where it's just graphic, his body marred beyond human oh, it's likeness. Isaiah 53 and, in the yeah, first 53, gospel. Yeah, yeah, 51 through 53 there. Yeah. It's just like, what? This doesn't make any <clears throat> sense. But so that's what you got to realize that the scriptures depend on. On the res on him being resurrected, and oh, I mean, and nowhere do you see that clearer than the third day references. And so, because Jesus is saying, like you're saying, Phil, on the third day I will rise. And so you see Paul talk about in First Corinthians 15, on the third day according to the scriptures. And you're like, no, wait a minute, is there anywhere in scripture that says that it will absolutely be on the third day? And you go back. And all of these references, it's like when uh, when Jesus says, um, I can't remember exactly where it is, but he said nothing uh, more than the sign of Jonah yeah. is going to be given. Yeah. Well, that's a third day reference. And when you start he was looking in the belly. about third yeah. day references, it's all over the place in Scripture. But we didn't know that the sign of Jonah was a prophecy until Jesus told us it was. That's exactly right. How would we know? Exactly. Hang on, let's uh, let's take a let's take a break. That's so funny though, because when people hear the story of Jonah, I mean, people who don't believe mm -hmm. in, in Jesus, they're like, I mean, this, that story's ridiculous. I'm like, well, it's not any more ridiculous than a guy dying. Yeah, <laughs> three days later, coming back from the dead, and like, look, announces it. Uh, Jesus from that time on in Matthew he begins in chapter 16 after quite a bit of time of showing what he can do mm. they're, they're looking at what he can do and they're like whoa whoa here whoa well when he gets to chapter 16 and in, in Mark it's chapter 8 in Luke it's still there but it keeps coming up from that time on Jesus began to explain to his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. That's exactly Look, it. Look, you turn a page, he tells them again, mm -hmm. the Son of Man going to be betrayed in the hands of men, they'll kill him, and on the third day he'll be raised to life. That's chapter 17. Chapter 18, we get it, we're going up to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be betrayed in the chief priests, they're going to kill him three days. He, he keeps saying the same thing, and they're all looking around like, what's he talking about? Yeah. They really didn't even have a, a fix. Right. You know, Peter said, no way, that's ever going to happen. Right. The very thing that's going to save <clears throat> Peter's hide, mm -hmm. he was like, no way that's going to happen. Right. Condemning himself without realizing it. Well, so was everyone else. And being raised on the third day, Seeing Jesus, is believing. Jesus tells them, Three times, <laughs> you know, and it's just all of these third day references are just all throughout Scripture. I think about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's a there's a, a messianic prophecy in Psalms where it says that, you know, I will not abandon my holy one to decay. Yep. And you and that's all it says. And so when you get here comes Jesus and, and Martha runs out and is like. You know, if my if you'd been here, my my brother wouldn't have died. Uh, and he's like, no, he's he's gonna he's you know he's gonna live. And she's like, and she Martha does the same thing that we do. She's like, oh, I know, 
I know he's going to raise on the last day at the resurrection. He's like, no, Martha, you don't know, because I am the resurrection. And she is thinking that the resurrection is some future event. And Jesus is saying, no, the resurrection is a person and it's me. And so he says, Lazarus, come forth. And she's like, wait, stop. He's been in how many days? Four days. And don't open it. There'll be a bad odor. And so the Jewish people believed in their minds that the body did not decay. Why she was so fatal in that moment, it's too late because this is the fourth day. Anything beyond the third day, it's not possible to come back. And that's the point that that he is making is that, no, you understand I'm the resurrection. The resurrection is not dependent on three days or four days. This is still a third day reference in that. Pretty powerful. It's it's unbelievable. And so you go look and, and you read back all of these prophecies. And the third day, according to the scriptures, is all throughout scripture. But uh, this is the way Jesus, what did he do? He opens our minds mm-hmm. to, to Scripture, and this is what he did. Every time after the resurrection, he, he teaches them that all of this Old Testament is about him. It's by him. It's for him. It doesn't exist apart from him. Every word of it yep. is about him. Yep. Pretty cool. Oh, I like that. That's That could be a sermon title, Are you The Fourth Day. Yeah. Oh, oh I'm writing. I'm writing it down. It's all going right into the brain pad. <laughs> I think I'm up next. I have a I have a good illustration for you because somebody said this. I uh, heard it one time, but it just popped in my head. But they said, you know, the resurrection is like the receipt. Mm. And you say, what is a receipt? So if you have a receipt in your inner store, let's say you buy something and you get a receipt. And then you're still in the store and somebody comes up, you know, security, they're like, hey, did you pay for that? What do you do? You show them the receipt. Right. So the resurrection is the receipt because you don't, you, you, he's paid for your sins once and for mm-hmm. all. It, and once he came back from the dead, which was kind of what the ascension was like, once he was exalted, we're not going to do this all over again. It was grace that is eternal. Mm. So if you wanted three points, I would go with it's certain, and you can do the historical angle of it, and and why did the why is this the only religion in the history of the world that flourished once the leader died? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because it really wasn't taken yeah, off. You would have thought that that bunch is through. Yeah, it wasn't taken right. off until yeah. after he died. Every right. other one, once you kill the leader or the leader dies, well, the movement. Right. Yep. Dies. But this one flourished. It went from small to global. Uh, right. So and I would go with certain it's personal. And, and that gets back to that, this same Jesus. Mm. And he was like, look at my hands and my feet. It, it wasn't like some hocus pocus. We're going to be, right. it, it was a, I mean, and stayed here 40 days. He gave many convincing proofs that he was alive and he left as a human. So, because death is personal to me, it, yeah. it's, we all have it coming. It's uh, yeah. This is the path, it's and then I would say it's 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 love because you say, "What's love got to do with it?" Well, why come back? You come back so you can share life with other beings. Mm-hmm. That that's what the whole idea of the forever you can family. Give them what you have proven to be true. But yeah. us coming back, if only one person. Was raised, and I go back to the first fruits. Why is he the first fruits? Because if you were just by yourself, well, what what are you going to do the rest of eternity? Yeah. I mean, it, it's we get to love each other. I mean, it, you know, it is so it's so uh, inseparable because you go back to what Jesus is talking about. Anybody who tries to save their life is going to lose their life. Yeah, exactly. But if you lose your life. For my sake, you're going to find your life. My life is going to become, I, I came so that they may have life. And we, we have an idea that we have life somehow apart from Christ, and we don't. And this is what John 15 is, yep. is that you're just like a branch that is ripped off a vine. There's no life in you at all. Uh, because I live, you're going to live. Because you abide in me, my life is going to flow through you. That resurrection has to be there. 
Well, because everything, everything, everything you chase in life is unfulfilling. It always right. has the same end. Resurrection life is only available to those who have died. Yep. We don't get that. What part of you died <laughs> yeah. to sin? You died. I mean, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but yet Christ lives in me. In this life I live, I live by one thing, and that's faith. It's his life. It's not mine. It's his words. It's not mine. It's like he yep. raises that scepter and speaks through you and thousands come to Christ. It's not you speaking. It's his life in you. It is out. the greatest story ever told. It absolutely is. Every atheist I've talked to, I said, listen, let's just cut to the chase. Who has the best story? <laughs> right. And most of them, think, the honest ones, they'll think a little bit and they'll say, Y'all have the best story. I wish I had what y'all had. I yeah. had one tell me that. He said, he's on TV. You see him around. He said, I wish I just had that. He said, maybe when I get in the tunnel, I, I'll, I'll be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah. I said, move before you get yeah, in the tunnel. Yeah, come, come into the light. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, John, you don't, John 3. You don't want that to, you don't want to, to be a train. Let's take a break. So, so here's my question, because we've kind of been hitting on some of the points, and I'm taking notes, because I'm preaching on the resurrection this Sunday. So to, to each of you, I'll ask you this question. And I've already heard one that is really compelling to me that we've already talked about. What's the most compelling feature of the resurrection, of Jesus' resurrection to you? I mean, because the, the Scripture obviously is full of compelling features about the resurrection. But what's the one that compels you the most? about the resurrection. And while y'all are thinking, I'll mention one that I had written down and Larry, you just brought it up. It was from Romans six is the idea that the resurrection of Jesus is so powerful that it actually illustrates what we do in life mm -hmm. when we surrender and die to sin mm -hmm. and then come forth, which is that beautiful picture in Romans six of baptism. The idea is we're burying the old person mm -hmm and being raised to live a new life, which is a great picture of what Jesus did for us. So that's a compelling feature to me okay. is that it's more than just one meaning. It's, it's bigger than that. So what would you I'll, guys say? I mean, there's, I'll go first. Go okay. uh, I would say the most compelling feature to me is that it explains why there's so much suffering in the world. Mm. Uh, I wrote down this quote. I didn't know you were going to ask that question, but yeah. I'd, I'd written down this quote from Martin Luther that said, suffering is intolerable unless you're sure of your salvation. And when you ask that question, you know, I thought about this because I can, I can, I can get through difficulty and look, life is, is filled with difficulty and, and our current culture right now, there's a lot of things about it that is just painful. And you look at, you know, kids being abandoned to the drug epidemic to just the the lostness of our society in a lot of things and the crime in, in city, especially urban cities and bad things are happening all around us. But I'm like, you know what? I can make sense of this. God giving us a choice. God giving us Jesus. God giving us the documentation with Bibles to, you know, and, and other people, spirit filled people to have purpose on life. And even then life is still difficult mm -hmm. and bad things are happening, but I can endure. I can, I can tolerate and I can try to help others out as long as there's a certainty of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Cause to me, no matter what happens, <clears throat> that that's it. It's the only hope. I've ever heard of life beyond the grave. It's the only time I've ever heard that. Yeah. Have you ever read that anywhere else where the dead are raised? In any storybook you've ever read, I mean. Well, I mean, there's versions of it, I guess. Of, I mean, everybody has some after But a historical no. person that yeah, you're not, counting time by yeah, not, happens to be the one. Not where the subtle details the of the followers, you know, being this coming from the, a Jewish uh, religion where they just wouldn't believe this is possible unless they saw it. And, and it, they wouldn't believe, I mean, they wouldn't go to their, their, uh, their death 
rather than deny Jesus was the Christ, that, that he came back from the dead. It, it just wouldn't make sense. You know, yeah. I was like, wait a minute, these people wouldn't do this if this was all a hoax or a lie, and you have the historical documentation. Mm. But that, I chose that one because uh, about the suffering, because I feel like that's the number one argument to why there's no God. And I'm like, well, the number one answer to that is the resurrection. Mm -hmm. yep. Then all of a sudden you read that in the end, you know, God works all things for the good. Because if you take away death and you take away people's sins, you're making all things right. And it's almost unimaginable when you view heaven in that light in eternity that all of those injustices and all of those, all of that pain and all those tears and sadness and it's made right through the yeah. resurrection. It, it, it really is. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny you mentioned that. I thought about that when Dad used the word hope. That's the first thing that came to mind, Jason. You said that from that MLK quote was hope. hope. And it's interesting because he gave a pathway to hope and change. And we had a political campaign a few years ago, hope and change. But it's not going to happen through governments, through you know edicts and ideologies. Right. It's only going to happen through the resurrection. Right. Which I think is is powerful. I think probably hang, hang well, on. Hang well, on, Larry. Let's okay. let's take a break and then we'll hear yours. I think one of the most remarkable things in in the resurrection narrative and everything that is connected <clears throat> to that, I mentioned the the so that moments earlier, is the sovereignty of God in action. Every time you see the word so that is the, um, you know, we hear phrases like the gates of hell will not prevail against this, you know, and, and that's what he comes out of the grave with saying, I was dead and now I'm alive forever and I hold the keys of, of death and Hades, the realm of the dead in my hands, is, is the, this is outside of human will to defeat. It was like this power, you know, dunamis, this idea that it's a dominant thing in any given situation. There's nothing greater than the power that rose Jesus from that grave. And so the thing that, that just physically makes it um, <clears throat> so, so plain to me as, as man's will is trying to push back against this is the level that they went to. And so they immediately, when Jesus is buried, they're like, they don't have a body. Yeah. Okay. So what is the worst possible thing that can happen is for that body to disappear. We need that body to prove that he's just a man. Exactly. All right. And so they sealed the tomb. They put a seal on it. They've put ropes on it. There's the, the seal, the Roman impression, you know, that this thing cannot be opened. They post guards. Yeah, they didn't all have of cranes stuff. back then. You know, the big movers. Yeah, you know. all of that, all of that human effort to thwart this so that moment that God is going to put this big exclamation point on. Nothing in human capacity can stop this. Yeah. And so for me, uh, just watching watching the human pushback. Against yeah. what God, well, they know God is going to do it. I mean, they they absolutely then know. Then and now, yeah. What Larry's saying, if it's priests that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you there at Corinth there is that say there's no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection from the dead, not even Christ has been raised. Mm. If Christ has not been raised. You're preaching useless. So is your faith. Yeah, he's just saying. The whole story stands or falls on the resurrection That's of right. Jesus. It changes everything. It changes everything. Yeah. You say, so there is, you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're telling so me Larry, there's a chance. To add, to add even more to that, yeah. it, even once it happened, you remember they were, the human effort was still trying to cover it up because they paid the guards to lie. Yeah, exactly. About what really happened. Yeah. And then they were, and then they were killed yeah. to be silent. So, yeah. so, I mean, look at human yeah. effort still. We, yeah, even we, we mentioned Lazarus a while ago 
And so they like, okay. I mean, this I've said this on the podcast before. The thing that got Jesus killed was the resurrection of Lazarus because it was very publicly witnessed by everybody in Jerusalem because they all came out to Bethany and, and were mourning, and here comes Lazarus walking out. It's like, okay, what do we do now? There was plenty Not of only do we have to kill Jesus. To yeah. Yeah. We got to kill Lazarus now too, and so they're making a plot to kill them both to try to cover up evidence. And and yeah, well, we've talked about that before. What a ridiculous idea yeah. that somebody just raised somebody from the dead, and we say we got to kill him yeah. again. Yeah, actually, that's like when 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 Peter cuts the ear off of the guy at the you know, Gethsemane. And and Jesus heals him and just in front of everybody, and they still think it's a good idea to go ahead and arrest him. You know, <laughs> at that point, I, I it's the ridiculousness of of the way the human uh, mind works. Hard headed. Yeah, yeah. Unbelief is wow. It's a powerful thing. So, so, Dad, what is uh, in our remaining minutes here? What what is your biggest element of the resurrection that? get you fired up what is the the thing that jumps out at you for christ for uh first corinthians 15 mm. for christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep mm-hmm. all these ones before us since death came through a man the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man as in adam all die we all know that so in christ all will be made alive each in his own turn Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. It's good enough to hold me my every waking moment. Amen. It's good enough for me. Yeah. Which is a huge compelling factor. That's for nothing is more. The... That's the way it all ends. I just read to you how it out. That's the way it ends. I'm like, let's go for it. When that's exactly what it shows us is that idea about in the Hebrews where he said, he destroyed him who had the power, the fear of death you to, to, to show that that was the way that we would be able to survive yep. no matter what. Because you mentioned it, Larry, about Lazarus. The thing about Lazarus, he did die again. Yeah. I mean, he went through at some twice, point. Yeah. He went through it twice. Yeah. yeah. But he's he's going to be resurrected twice. Too. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> Which he has that that unique perspective. Yeah. You know, I can't wait to talk to him about I, what that was like. Yeah. Right? By the way, that's a good place to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. These are conversations for heaven. Uh, what was it? What was the difference in the first and the second? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think there's a vast difference between the two. Yeah, uh, I think that he'll be in a better place to answer that when we're standing there talking to him. So, yeah. well, and that's why conversations I, I think in eternity are going to be so amazing to to figure some of that out. I mean, yeah. I'm I, I started at one point. I've lost a, a list of questions I had for people. You know, once I get to see him in eternity, because oh. I mean, I assume we'll have a lot of conversation, or maybe we yeah. won't even care. I don't know. The last enemy to be destroyed. First Corinthians fifteen twenty six is death. Mm. You say it's an enemy that's destroyed. Right. You're like, and we live on. I, I just don't know why more wouldn't repent and get in on this action. That's right. Well, another compelling feature that I had was uh, from John chapter five, and that is that the resurrection. Because we tend to we tend to totally put it in a in a believer's positive, you know, because that's what we are. Mm-hmm. So to Jason's point, we think about suffering, we think about all these things we're delivered from. But you know, John five, you know, twenty eight twenty nine is a pretty scary um, picture of the resurrections. Uh, Paul mentions it in Acts twenty four fifteen as well right. that the resurrection is also a gateway to judgment and justice right. for all of mankind. Right, and that's what verse 27 says. Right, that's yeah. exactly right. So the, a compelling feature to me is, you know, people say, well, I don't even believe any of that stuff. Well, okay, but if what I believe is true, which I think it is, you will be raised from the dead, and you will face an account of your life mm-hmm. in the body right. for eternity. I mean, we... I mean, Jesus made that abundantly clear. Is that not true? Oh, absolutely. So would it be wrong to say if they say, I don't even believe in that stuff, and you say, well, you will. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, exactly like, what? right. Yeah. Oh, you will. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That may be a little too confrontational. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> but you it's know. true. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yesterday I heard Phil in class and he was, he was talking, you know, everybody runs to John 3.16. That's where everybody wants to hear, but nobody wants to talk about John 17 through 21. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that you already stand condemned, that, that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Because everybody's already snake bit. That's where he opened up in 14. You're told the verdict. What the verdict is. Right. And here is the verdict. And you know what a verdict is, is a a rendering of a judgment. Yep. That's a verdict. Uh, And so the verdict is, is that people love darkness instead of light. Yep. And so everybody... Everybody knows there's there's light and dark. That's the very first thing. Let there be light. And we're not yeah. talking about the sun. We're talking about the contrast That's between right. light and dark, good and evil, choice of God or choice of man. Who's in charge? And that's what the Tower of Babel is about. You yeah. know, it's like, no, I'm going to be in charge. And God is like, no, you're not. I think yeah. that's why <laughs> when I started off with that dream, that's what kind of hit me. Yeah. That Nobody ever really talks about. I mean, can you imagine those people that contributed to Jesus's death? Yeah. I mean, you're standing before God and he's like, yeah, I use your your immorality yeah. basically to save the world. But I mean, what a, what a play. I would, I would hate to be a part of that. Well, that's that's Revelation 19. Um, John gives us a picture of Jesus return. And I know that's you know where we began that series. But it's like every eye will see him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Everybody will see him, even those who pierced him. Oh, yeah. And that is the fulfillment of a prophecy from Isaiah, you know. And we read Revelation 19. And I, there was one thing I made yesterday. There's three Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in one sentence, you know, right there in, in Revelation 19. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's just filled with everything that has been written is going to be fulfilled about me. I will suffer. I'll be handed over. It's what you just read in 1 Corinthians 15. Yep. Every single element's going to be fulfilled. Yep. And that's what the resurrection proves. Yeah. That's good stuff. i uh, yeah. got a lot of good stuff to work on. I've got a few more <laughs> ideas. I'm going to bounce off y'all in the overtime because we're out of time. Uh, if you want to follow us over, it's blazetv.com slash unashamed. And uh, by the way, if you sign up, not only do you get our overtime segments, but also there are 800 episodes of In the Woods with Phil that are then you'll have access to. So you want to get some good Phil stuff. That's where you want to go. So check it out. BlazeTV.com slash Unashamed. We'll see you in overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.